and I'll pass it over to Ron Byrne, who will introduce our speakers and our session for today. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Julianne. Good morning, everybody uh, on Zoom and in the Oak Room. Um, this is our first course as, uh, class, as you as you know, in the uh, the course featuring the special collections at uh, Smathers Library at UF. Um, that collection, I, I'm convinced, is one of the real treasures of the university, often not um, as well known, but um, we're going to remedy that this semester as in, they, they've uh, presented with us before, but we're going to take another shot at it this semester. Um, our, um, the collections are taken care of on a day-to-day -day basis by a staff of professional library, uh, library science people. Uh, each have their own areas of responsibility. Um, but um, very often, they get together as we're going to see today to collaborate on a project that has special meaning for them and also gives them the opportunity to draw on the, the content and the richness of the special collections material so that they can bring that to the public, get it out in the public eye so that people can can all enjoy this uh, this treasure that we have. Um, our, our first of three presenters um, uh, is Bridget Ben Manuel. And Bridget, you, you're in uh, the conference room there. We'll wave your hand so people will know who you are. That's Bridget. Um, Bridget, had, Bridget has a PhD in history from University of Florida. She's um, um, been in, in her current position as collections coordinator for Florida history since 2016. Um, her special interests are, um, as you would expect, um, 20th century U.S. history focusing on the South and most specifically on uh, Florida. Um, our second presenter, who is also in the conference room, that's, that's Hank Young. Hank, would you raise your hand? There's Hank. <laughs> Hank has been in the library business since 1983, serving in the libraries all over the country, uh, from Southern Methodist University, Northern Arizona. Um, he's been at UF since 2002. And his role is he's a cataloger. And when I asked, I said, well, what does a cataloger do? And he said, uh, he gave me a sentence, which I'm just going to read. He says, in charge of cataloging all formats of materials throughout the campus library. So his job um, encompasses a bit more than just special collections. The catalogers provide the data which is displayed in the public catalog describing UF owned physical materials. Um, interesting job, Hank um, describes himself as a kind of a data wonk, but I think you'll see he's much more than that. Our, our third presenter um, is um, um, Carol McAuliffe. And Carol, um, since 2006, I believe, has been the MAP libra librarian at the UF uh, special collections, and that map collection is one of the largest academic map collections in the country. Um, has maps from um, uh, all the way from, I'd say, antique maps to aerial photography and everything in between. Carol has a master's in um, library science from um, um, FSU. But we, we won't hold that against her. So, so these are our three collaborators. They've been working on this to bring us this view of the lost communities of Florida. We'll let them get started. And Carol, you're going to lead off, right? Yes. Um, I think Bridget and Hank are going to share um, their screen. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to be here again with you all today. Um, so I'm starting off by telling you that 
um, kind of give you a little sneak peek into our presentation series that we've developed for you. Um, today, we have uh, Researching Lost Communities of Florida with Bridget and Hank and myself. Um, and the next week, um, our chair of our department, Haven Holly, will be here. Um, talk, or I don't know if she's doing it on Zoom or here there in person, but um, the new trail and Native children's education at the Phoenix Indian School. And as you can see, there's going to be a lot of wonderful topics coming. And um, we always appreciate uh, the engagement with the Okamic community. It's been a wonderful collaboration. So, um, and now I will turn it over to our first presenter, Bridget. Except that it's Hank. Oh, <laughs> it's Hank? I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, no, not, a, not a problem. Thanks, I wasn't sure it was me either. Uh, howdy, everyone. Uh, just wanted to let you know that uh, we have a exhibit currently in the Smathers Library right outside of the Special Collections Grand Reading Room. Yes. It's open the same hours as the reading room. Which yes, it is. I could, can't tell you what those hours are because I don't work there. <laughs> there I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. There, but, <laughs> but, but Bridget, I'll let Bridget fill you in. And uh, it's going to be up through April 8th. It's called The Lost Communities of Florida. And we kind of tried to hit a lot of places today that are not featured in this exhibit. Because we know that some people may have already may have already seen the exhibit or may have come to our exhibition opening that was on Zoom. And I know that. Uh, we, we did that with Josh, Josh Goodman. Goodman. Oh, I just went blank on his last name for a moment there. <laughs> and so if any of y'all can come out, we'd, lo we'd love to have you out and take a look at some of the materials that we pulled. And so this is, this is the actual exhibit gallery on the second floor of Smathers Library. As Hank said, it's literally right outside the doors of the Grand Reading Room. So if you've ever visited us, you know, the room with the, looks like a Harry Potter library, as people call it, oh, okay. on that second, yes, that's what they call it, Carol's nodding probably. Um, it's right outside that door, and our presentation today is going to be based in part on this um, exhibit and the research that we've been doing that predates the exhibit on extinct cities, and as Hank said, the exhibit's open essentially when the Grand Reading Room is open. And so the hours this semester are nine, hold on. The, the exhibit closes early before special collections, the reading room closes. So roughly from nine to five, Monday through Friday, that space is open. Literally, because there's a gate, they close it at the end of the day. Right. So don't come five minutes to closing and expect the exhibit to be open because it'll be, it'll be closed by then. But we are also, in case you didn't know at, at Hokamic, we are open for research. So if you want to come by and ex explore some extinct cities in special collections, nine to nine to six Monday through Thursday and nine to five on Friday, the Grand Reading Room is actually open. So come on by. You'd, we used to require during the pandemic times an appointment ahead of time. It's not required. It's preferred. So if you want to come visit us and you want us to pull materials, just let us know and we'll make those things available to you. But we're always happy to have visitors. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how this project started. Bridget and I were working together on a completely separate project and we, and we were just saying, you know, we should write a paper together someday. We, and after saying this for about two years, we finally, Bridget finally said, okay, let's have a meeting. Let's talk about this. Let's come up with something. If we're gonna do this, let's do it. And I said, okay. And so we got together, we had lunch, and I told her about uh, some newspapers I had recently cataloged. It was for the town of Noonansville, and I had never heard of Noonansville, Florida. Uh, I, I am new to the state, I just moved here in 2002. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I didn't know about Noonansville, and I had discovered that it, it was the original county seat of Alachua County, uh, but then eventually 
they built a railroad a little bit too far to the east and about half the people moved away because they couldn't get to work. Uh, and then another railroad came along that actually went to the new town of Alachua and it was a little too inconvenient. So a lot of people moved there. Also about that time, they moved the county seat from Noonansville to Gainesville. And so Noonansville just kind of dried up and died away in the 1890s. And we're not quite sure when it became uninhabited, but we do know that sometime in the 1970s, the town was just completely razed. The county, the county just sent out bulldozers and there was a notice in one of the newspapers that said, if you want anything from Innisville, come and get it. So we have left now is a cemetery. The, I think it's listed in the Noonansville Alachua Cemetery, uh, kind of in between where both towns, towns would be. This is an image from the, the, the cemetery, actually. Yep, and that's, that's, that's where I took this, this photo. I went out there one day. Uh, there's a black cemetery and a white cemetery. And I'll tell you, I was following Google Maps, and it actually led me to the black cemetery which I thought was interesting because I thought, wow, this is you know, a very small cemetery, but it was obviously still very much in use. And then I went around, it's like, oh, oh, no, I'll bet that this is the white cemetery here. <laughs> you know, it's obviously much larger, much better kept up. I mean, there's definitely, you could see the, you know, racial difference that, you know, and how it was, and how the two were. And so we were talking about this and I said, you know, I was, one of the things catalogers do is we have a way that we present the names of cities. And if I were talking about Alexandria, Egypt, I would actually put extinct city after the end of Alexandria because it's underwater. It's, it's, it's gone. <laughs> it's all, it's all underwater now. So I wanted to do that with Noonansville. And I found out that for some reason, the Library of Congress only allows tap wells, cities that disappeared before 1500 to be called extinct cities. And even if they are in North or South America and they just, and they're European and they just disappeared before 1500, we still don't call them extinct cities. So I, I thought that that was kind of odd and I thought it was a useful piece of information for people to have. And so I thought it would be nice to try and change that. Well, that's when I was talking to Bridget and she said, you know, well, do you have a list of these cities? I said, no, I don't. And so we started doing a little bit of research and we found over 200 extinct communities in Alachua County alone, over 200. And that's then that is the current Alachua County. Uh, Alachua County has changed size many times. So that was how this project got started. And as a side note, we still don't have an article written. We still have a word. <laughs> we, you know, we never got we, to it. We, we, we started doing the research started doing research. We started writing the article at one point. I, I have I have a page, page of it, uh, just some initial thoughts. And then suddenly someone said, why don't you do an exhibition? That was me, actually. And then we did the exhibition and and then we were going to get started on it and we got invited to do this. So we said, okay. So, <laughs> and we've actually got another gig uh, coming up. So yeah, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> well, we'll get around to the article eventually. We'll get there eventually, but... <laughs> One of the things that when you have a project like this, you have to start by defining terms. And it seems like this should be a simple task, but in terms of lost communities, it's not. First of all, what is a city? We, we still don't have a good definition for that. We could not find, we looked through all the literature, terms we could find. So there's not an easy way to decide what a city is and what it isn't. But well, we did find out evidently a city is where citizens live. Which um, for our purposes is, is perhaps less than useful. And so when we were 
initially designing the exhibit, we were trying to decide what terms to use. And we didn't want to use city and we didn't want to use town because those are a little bit squishy. So we came up with communities and we use communities for a particular reason because we wanted this term to kind of be as broad as possible to encompass a lot of different types of places. So at some time a community could be an incorporated city or town. In our case, they're not incorporated anymore generally, but they started out that way at some point in their history, or it could be just a small place where 30 or 40 families live and they gave it a name. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of those all over Florida. And then we started talking about what does lost mean? Well, it could mean that it was an incorporated town and it disincorporated for whatever reason. We've seen examples of that. Or it could be a place that like, like Noonansville, it just kind of faded away because the, the railroad left. And in some cases, people still live in that area. And in some cases, there's actually no trace left. The buildings are even gone. So pinning down what we mean has been a little difficult. So we try to be inclusive. So sometimes we mean an incorporated town. Sometimes we mean a place that was not incorporated. Sometimes we mean a place that is completely gone. And sometimes these places are, are on our list because they're really greatly reduced from what they were when they started. Right? And so, for example, um, there's a community in Marion County, it's called Anthony. Anthony was actually an incorporated city at one point in its life. And it disincorporated during the Great Depression and just couldn't hold itself together financially. And that happened to a lot of places apparently. But there's still a community in Anthony. There's a school, there's, a, I think, still a post office. And there's still people who live there that consider themselves to live in Anthony. So that's one example. But there's other places, like, if you ever take Highway 27 out to Tallahassee, you know, going west, you'll pass a series, the closer you get to Tallahassee, you pass a series of these little signs with names like Chairs and Buddha. And you look around, and you're like, so where's the town? The name, the name persists. but you know, what it was, the heart of it is now gone. And in Florida, we have towns, we have cities, and we have unincorporated communities. So if you're not a town, if you're not a city, that's what you're considered, you're part of the county. And so places like Anthony and Chairs and Buddha are unincorporated communities. And again, in those respects, they vary. So we're actually gonna give you some examples today of some places, because it's all well to define them, but we'll give you some I'll actually give you some examples, and I think most of the places we're talking about today, maybe not all of them, but most of them actually aren't in existence anymore. And we're going to start with Pilgrimage Plantation. This is one of the ones we actually talked a little bit about in the exhibit. So I'm sure that most of us have been to the town of Micanopy, just south of Gainesville. And if you're walking around Micanopy, you have probably walked past this historic marker and didn't even notice it was there. It's sort of in the center of town where that uh, you know, between the two streets, there's that little median. There's some benches and trees there. That's where it sits. And it's commemorating Moses Levy. And Moses Levy was, he was a Jewish, he was a Jewish man. He was a, a, a very wealthy merchant. He's actually the son of a merchant from Morocco. And at some point in time, in his youth, Moses moved to um, the Caribbean and became a merchant there. He made his fortune there. He actually owned a sugar mill. That was one of his investments. He did quite well with it. I think it was in Puerto Rico, maybe. And um, one of the things that he wanted to do with his wealth and prestige, if you will, is create a Jewish utopia, essentially. He wanted to have a, a space where Jews in um, Europe who were being persecuted for being Jewish could have a place where they could go and set up their own settlement. And it was meant to be communal. And he was, because he was so familiar with the Caribbean, he was looking to expand into Florida. He saw agricultural opportunities, there was land there. And so he decides to set up pilgrimage plantation. And the idea was that they were going to grow sugar. And the, it was, again, a communal, everyone would share in the profits of the sugar growing and that's how the colony would survive and they would grow their own crops on the side. And so pilgrimage, he, he, he had a partner in Europe and they were actually able to attract about 30 Jewish settlers that actually moved from Europe to Florida. 
Now, if you've ever been to that area of Mikinope, you know there's not a whole lot around there. There wasn't then either. <laughs> and although Mikinope was kind of a happening place, it's it's because of its particular location near near bodies of water and so on and so forth. And the Arredondo grant was there, and they were the person who owned that grant was looking to have settlers come in. By the way, this, these are very brief descriptions because these stories could, could go on for a while. But he attracted these people, brings them to Florida. He builds, he builds like a plantation house. And then the settlers had their own individual homes around it. A couple of problems here. First of all, Jews from Europe who live in urban areas don't know anything about farming. That's, that's, that's one of the problems. And he, the colony was very expensive, and he could never make it profitable. And so eventually the, the colony just faded away. After about two or three years, he, Moses Levy actually spent most of his time in Europe, not in Florida after that. And so the colony just gradually, the people just left. And the, the building itself, Pilgrimage Plantation, actually burned down in the 1830s during the Seminole Wars. So there's actually no trace of that property left. And this image here, um, there's a a historian who lives in Micanopi, his name is uh, C.S. Monaco, and he studied Moses Levy pretty extensively. And he knows where the location of Pilgrimage Plantation was. And this young man, Michael Adno, went down there, and he had a photographer with him. And this image shows, this is a field roughly where, because I think it's on private property, the original location of Pilgrimage Plantation. So you can't just wander onto somebody's property, but this is a field near there. And this is what it looks like. Literally, it's gone. So who, had ever, who would have ever thought that in the middle of Florida, in Micanopy, 20 minutes away from us, there was a utopian community or attempts to establish one for Jews from Europe who were facing persecution. Moses was an interesting guy. He, he also believed in the gradual emancipation of slaves. And he, he was a reformed Jew. And he wanted people, his settlers, to be able to... Um, I'm not Jewish, so I don't want to mess this up. To uh, not have to deal with the authority of the rabbis. He was, again, very quite liberal in that. And so he was just a fascinating character. And his, his son is the better known person. His son, David, David Levy Uli, was actually one of the first state senators from Florida. So it's a very well-known family. So you've probably heard of David. You may not have heard of Moses, but they're important. Both important in different ways. And of course, you've you known them from the counties. And from the counties. <laughs> counties named after them. Yes, so you've probably seen that as well. Uh, so I wanted to talk about Merritt Island. Uh, one of the things that Ron didn't cover is I had an internship working for NASA at one point. So anything about NASA, I, I love. Um, and here we have Merritt Island. Uh, you know, it was an old, old island, uh, had a really good pineapple and citrus industry. Uh, you have uh, some sounds that were founded by slaves who were recently free after the, after the Civil War. And unfortunately, the Hurricane of 1896. <laughs> this is a common theme. <laughs> totally wiped out the, the pineapple. It basically wiped out pineapples from Florida. Um, because Florida was a big pineapple, you know, growing state at, you know, at the time. And so, uh, but still you had a lot of, a lot of citrus. Uh, around the around the uh, 1950s, uh, like I said, here it's mostly known as a fisherman's paradise. I, I used to read a lot of Stephen King books and I think it's funny because they're always talking about the summer people in Stephen King novels. You know, the people who all only live up there in Maine in the summer. Well, there are snowbirds. <laughs> It, it occurred to me, it's like, okay, they're the same people. And so when they weren't in Maine, a lot of them were living here on Merritt Island and just having the good life. But when uh, 
the government decided to establish Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center. It obviously bought up a lot of the towns, a uh, lot of space from the towns, mostly in the, mostly in the northern part of the island. But even the southern part of the island, you know, there's a lot of noise, a lot of stuff going on. You know, and when you're on a military base like that, you do your shopping, you know, at the base. You're not going to go to Publix because, you know, the military bases are, are going to be just better prices for you. Uh, and so you just had a lot of the towns, even to the south, just start disappearing. And one of those I wanted to highlight was Eldora, uh, the man who, who founded the community of Eldora had two daughters, Ellen and Dora, that's where, uh, that, that's where the town got its name. And it was, it was a nice little town, city. I'm fishing village. Once again, you, you know, whatever you want to call it, it was, it, they were, they were pretty proud. They, you know, had a nice school, school that as many as 13 students at one point, post office, Post offices are very important. We'll, we'll circle we're, back around. We're, we're going to talk about post offices a bit. <laughs> a bit. Henning Lodge, and I found reference to Al Capone's network, said it was stretched from Volusia County to Chicago. And so evidently, there it was a lot of stuff during Prohibition you know, going on because, of course, you had a lot of rich people staying on these islands. But by the late 1970s, it's a ghost town. This house is the only remaining building from Eldora, and it's not actually, it's been moved. It's been moved. It's not where it was originally, but uh, even where it is now, it's still like the only thing around. You've got to make, it's, it's really recommended that you uh, make a reservation to go see it if you ever decide to head out that way. So yeah, government, federal government comes in, buys up all the property, the towns go away. Yep, that, that happens a lot. <laughs> yes, but let's move to something totally different. <laughs> we're going back to Marion County again because Marion County's cool, I guess. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about one of Carol's favorite places, which is Marty City. And the image here that you see on the screen is actually, um, it's an art installation in Scott Springs Park. And it's commemorating the cigar workers who lived in Marty City. This is only half of the art installation. There's more panels, and those panels are dedicated to African American laborers. So if you happen to be in Ocala and you happen to be in Scott Springs Park, you know, go and see the, the art installation. So we're going to journey back to the late 19th century. Many of you are familiar, if you're from Florida at all, you're familiar with the with Ybor City and its which was originally, which was originally a cigar producing area. And in the late 19th century, Ocala was again a happening place. We had railroads, we had steamboat lines, we had citrus and phosphates. It was actually a, a, an up and coming place and it was reaching out to try to find other ways to make money. And so one of the things they did was, you know, town leaders and developers were saying, hey, this would be a great place to have a cigar factory. Because you know, there were some ethnic and racial tensions that were happening in both Ybor City and in Key West, which is where the main locations of the factories were. And a few people, flip the slide, a few people actually did take them up on this. And so you see in late 19th century Ocala, these cigar factories come up. And then this area is called Marti City. It's named after Jose Marti, who was the great Cuban revolutionary. And this map is actually based on the Sandbor maps, which we'll, we'll circle back around to that too. But you can see where they were located. And at one point in time, there were about, I think, 600 Cuban immigrants that were living in the West End of what is now Ocala in Marti City and rolling cigars. It was profitable for a little while, but if you notice on this map, all of these cigar factories close at the same time. So it wasn't because they didn't like Ocala, what was happening in Cuba, actually, is that there was an insurrection. The Cuban people were rebelling against Spanish rule. They wanted to be independent. In fact, you see this happen 
This is the sort of the precursor to the Spanish-American War in 1898. And the factories were acquiring their tobacco directly from Cuba. It was being imported. And with an insurrection on the island, that means there was less tobacco growing. And the, the factories in Ocala or Marti City were facing increasing competition from other cities that were also home to cigar factories, including Tampa, where uh, Henry Plant was investing very heavily. And so when those imports of tobacco were coming through, they weren't going to Marti City. They were being siphoned off to other places. So with no tobacco, there's no work. So all of these people that were in Marti City just started to leave to go to other places where they, the cigar factories were still active. And so literally almost overnight, Marti City is a ghost town. It's gone. Uh, we decided on pronunciation of uh, Sina Ote, I think. We're still, uh, we're still not sure. We're not really sure what, the, what this town is, but it was originally called Depot Key. Uh, and it was the original site for Cedar Key, Florida. But uh, to make a long story short, 1896, there's a hurricane. There's a hurricane. <laughs> ten, ten foot storm surge. They and it destroyed the. There was a factory, a lumber yard, uh, providing cedar wood for uh, the pencil. Faber Pencil Company. Yeah, there was a pencil factory in that area. Well, no, the pencil factory was in New York. The, the, they were just sending the wood. Okay, big they, they were just area. sending wood there. But yeah, the actual factory was in New York. Um, but you, so you had this community, it was doing really well, and they, and up, just so much of it was destroyed, and they said, yeah, let's not rebuild here, let's go a little bit further inland. So, so once again, hurricane medges come in. I really love this image that uh, we found from the Library of Congress, and if you look close, you can you can on it. You can actually see uh, the cedar lumber mill there. And I'll, I'll take your word for it because I can't quite see it. But yeah, we, we've got it blocked. We've got part of it blocked by <laughs> by the by, by, the zoom, by face zoom. Yeah, the, the zoom screen. But uh, it was you know it was a yeah really nice place. And now it's and, now it's gone. I and, think. And and the thing is right now yeah. They say it's an average of three inches above sea level right now. So now, even now, it's like sometimes it's underwater part of the year and sometimes it's not. <laughs> I think the only thing left actually may be a cemetery. That's it. Yeah. There's not much left. Exactly. So, so now that we've teased you with a few interesting <laughs> places, we're going to tell you, give you some examples of materials that you can use to kind of find them. And Hank is going to start us off very briefly, and this, if you were at the exhibit opening, this is something that we already mentioned, but we're going to review it again in case you didn't uh, participate in the right. exhibit opening. Uh, first of all, it's postal history. We have in special collections microfilm set, uh, and it's all of the applications for post offices. And fortunately, this has been digitized now. Yay! Because Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I hate microfilm so much, <laughs> and it may not look may not look any better, but you get a lot of information from these. You where the you actually have a map of where the post office is going to be established. That's the right image, and here. that's what you see on the right. It's you know where they want to put it, and on the left, uh, there's information about about what's the nearest post office to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. Uh, what what uh, post offices are currently serving the town and how far away are those? Uh, and then what I really love is you'll go in and they would put in the name of the town and a lot of times the post office would go through and they'd cross it out and say, no, you can't use that name. We've already used that. And so uh, they'll have to come up with another name. And in some cases, you actually wind up having the town changes its name uh, later. And so 
When that happens, new postal application saying, we're changing the name of the town from this to this, we'd like to change the name of the post office from this to this. And, and, and on the left side of this image, one of the parts of the application, they actually give you the township and range. Yes. So you can actually map out exactly where these places were located. So, so you've, got the, you've got the latitude and longitude. You know, and, yeah, and this, uh, unfortunately, these are these these are digital images from the microfilm, and yes, they are skewed like that on the film. So my my Photoshop skills are not that bad. This is actually what it looks like. <laughs> uh, next, there's census records. Uh, unfortunately, you can only go back to 1940 for the full census. Although the 1950 census is starting to appear now, and so, so if you know that, you know, if you know that a town existed and you know what county it, it was in, you can go back and you can look for people who lived in that county. Uh, also, you, if you have someone that you're searching for and, uh, and it says, you know, I'm just thinking of my mother. My mother was born in London, London, Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> I have never found London. I'm not even sure it exists anymore. <laughs> so, you know, uh, that's that's outside the scope of our project, but, uh, you know, it, it's, it's at least some evidence that the town of London, Tennessee did exist. And just all kinds of useful things. And of course, I bet some, there are some genealogists out there, you know, probably use these. <laughs> I think, I think they're the census workers may even provide the township and range as well. So you can, you can also map it. But another, this one may be a little bit more obvious than others, another resource is newspapers. And I have two examples for you here. You'll notice one is from 1903 and the other one is from 2005. So we have in, UF, in the UF digital collections, we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pages of old newspapers that have been digitized. And this one, the Ocala Evening Star, you often get these little columns that talk about local events. This person is visiting that person. This person got married. This person had a baby. And it'll actually tell you what these little communities are. This is Eureka. As far as I know, there isn't much of Eureka left. There is a boat launch there. Okay. But I think the name persists. And so if you go back to the 1903 edition of the Ocala Evening Star, you'll find this. And there's similar bits of information like this through a lot of the early 20th century newspapers. But the example from 2005, here's the thing about journalists, they love a good human interest story and ghost towns or lost communities or whatever you call them are actually a very popular topic. And so some of these journalists will go and write articles about these places. And so they, they actually provide some interesting information that you can't get in other ways. They actually interview people from those areas sometimes. And you know, sometimes they have access to like photo files from, you know, this is the Calistar banner. They might have had some of their original photos that they took from the early 20th century at their disposal. So, you know, go look at the digital images of the old articles, but also keep an eye out for the more recent ones because you will find pieces like this one from David Cook, who was a well-known local historian in Marion County, that tell you about these areas. And Genealogists, ah, uh, genealogists, as Hank just mentioned, I think you guys have an active genealogy group out there at Okamek. But the thing about genealogists is they're not just interested in their relatives, they're also interested in the places that those people come from. And they're very steeped in local, rec local history records. And so as part of their research, they often chart the names of all of these lost communities. And this example here is from Levy County. So their uh, genealogical society, I guess, put together this list. So it's, it's, it's online. You can actually find this quite easily. The link is in the presentation. And Hank and I have actually spent a lot of time with this list because it helped us find some of these places. And, and also some of the sources that you can get your hands on easily that genealogists use a lot, like ancestry.com or family search, you can search those resources easily and come up with some of these places. You'll get the data from them. This is one of my favorite ones. It's not as obvious. So this, there's this, this, in this particular image, we have a lady who's posting in Marion County 
is posting about her uh, grandfather who was in Granville. I'm pretty sure Granville is not there anymore, but she was posting to a social, to Facebook and to a Facebook group called Marion County, Florida Memories prior to 1970. And so traditionally we have archives and libraries that have social media accounts and they love to share interesting materials from their collections. They'll digitize them and put them up. So that's one way you can find this information. I sent Hank stuff like this all the time. Yes, my, my, my Facebook. is loaded with, from, with, yes. with extinct cities. And um, for example, the state library, they used to once a month put up a new historic map that was digitized so you could see, you could see all the place names. But some, and of course, genealogists, historical societies, they all have these web pages and they're sharing bits of information. But in this case, this was just a person who was interested in the history of Marion County. And so they put up a Facebook page. And so people who live there, they join this group and they're sharing information. So they might have like, this lady has a picture of her grandmother and some related documents. And sometimes it's, it's a really great way to get at materials that you can't get in other places because these are usually privately held things. They're yeah. scanning their own documents so that she, and they're sharing them so that um, other people can appreciate this history. Anthony actually, speaking of Anthony, has its own little Facebook page okay. and people sharing photographs and saying, oh, Anthony was such a wonderful place to live. You know, it's a wonderful place to grow up. So this is another avenue. And one of our favorites, I didn't, I could have put it here. Um, there's a gentleman whose name is Joe Dunn and he calls himself the Florida Trailblazer. Yes. And he, he's a hiker essentially. And he goes and he films his hikes and some of the places he likes to go hiking are places that don't exist anymore. And he shows up, you know, and shows social media what they look like. Historical documents. This is another obvious one, but I'm gonna share a few particular ones with you. This one is actually, we talked about this at the exhibit opening. So a lot of cities, and I mean actual cities, had um, city directories, which are pretty much overgrown phone books. But you had to actually have a real city. And it really, the coverage was only for that city. But this, this particular publication is a, is a state gazetteer, which is a similar, a similar idea, and, and also a business directory. And on the right side, you can see one of the entries. So, this publisher was trying to literally list every business that existed in the state of Florida. And so, yeah, sorry, Hank is moving the box so we can see. And this is an example from Calhoun County. It's called Abe's Spring. Population was 75. Um, it's listing all of the business, the businesses that were in, in existence in Abe, in Abe Spring and all the planters. Um, I looked up Abe Spring the other day just because I was curious. This is another area that's technically still there, it's actually unincorporated. But if you look at Google Earth View, there aren't 75 people living there. There's a church, there's fields and a few houses. But with a resource like this, you can kind of get an idea of what it used to be like. Ah, and these next two documents are related to one another. They, um, remember when we were talking about Marty City and the, the city leadership was trying to get people to come and move to Ocala and start businesses and make money. So a lot of developers and other people did the same. And this is an example of one of these sort of documents, these boosterism documents, where they're, they're really just waxing philosophical about how wonderful Florida is and why you should move there. If you cut through all of that you know, boosterism, you can sometimes find wonderful descriptions of what a place was like. And so this Eaton of the South is actually all about Alachua County. It's one of my favorite resources. And I, I, I clipped here for you a little bit of uh, information about a few places that are featured in Eaton of the South. Uh, Gruel is actually the previous name of Rochelle, which is still a small community. I, I can't remember the fate of Loch Lusa. I think Tarver is gone, but it's got these nice, they, they literally describe the landscape sometimes and the type of agriculture and stuff that's being practiced there. So they're useful, they're actually very useful sources. If again, you have to cut through all of that, Florida is a wonderful part. And this is another similar document, Webb's Historical, Industrial, and Biographical Florida. And it's 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 sort of like a gazetteer and it's listing county by county. It has entries, and within those entries, they list all the cities that exist. And this one is another Lasher County, Palmer and Phoenix were a couple of places. I think Phoenix is gone. I don't remember what 
what the fate of Palmer was. So these are, and both of these items actually belong to, belong to the PK Young Library at Special Collections, which most of the exhibit is based on our materials because that's where I work. Right. And so many of the things we showed you today, you can actually find if you come into our library and many of them are digitized like these last two. And my favorite thing to do is to jump on my motorcycle or in the car and just go out and see it. And at the very beginning, when we were having trouble deciding if the city was extinct, if I went there and I said, there's no there there. In this case, this is me in Brewster, Florida. <laughs> there it is, Brewster. Brewster, Brewster was, a, it was a phosphate producing community. It was actually a community town. It was built by the phosphate a company. Company town, yeah. But when the, the factory shut down, Factory shut down. There went the town. They let the people take their houses with them. And well, they, they, yeah, they bought them and they moved them away from where Brewster is. And all that's left, I think, is a smokestack. And this, I think this is the railroad track, is what Hank Yeah, there is a railroad track that's been paved up. Oh, wait, there was one more slide. One of the <laughs> one of our favorite and most used sources is maps. maps. This, this is a map that's actually in the exhibit, but I'm not going to tell you about maps. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we we're going to let an expert tell you about maps. We have an expert here who's, who can tell you all about maps, and she's going to do that right now. Hello. All right, let me try to share my screen, and then we can talk about maps. So as you have seen, that it, maps have been kind of central to the conversation about these places because, you know, they're you know, that's how a lot of this research is being done. So we're going to be talking though about some specific things that are found in the map and imagery library um, that here, I'm not quite on the right PowerPoint slide yet. Let me get to where we were. So that was the missing slide <laughs> a minute ago. Um, and now we're gonna talk about using maps to uh, research lost cities and communities and the map and imagery library specifically. Now, if you all haven't had a chance to come in for a bit, um, we are still on the first floor of Smathers Library. Um, the map and imagery library was founded in 1973. We have nearly a million cartographic items, um, maps and aerial photographs. And as Ron had kindly introduced us earlier, we are in the top five academic map libraries in the United States and the largest in the Southeast, so UGA does have some uh, disagreement on that, <laughs> on that point. So um, the first thing, one of the first maps, uh, kinds of maps that I want to talk about are sectional maps of Florida. Now, these are done to um, delineate where the sections are throughout the state. Um, they were often done by railroad companies that were either trying to sell land or um, you know, promote those areas. And they're very large sheets and they have a lot of detail, which makes them incredibly useful for researching these lost communities. Um, we have a collection at the University of Florida that uh, ranged from about 1887 to 1958. And many of these have been digitized in UFDC. Um, this particular one is showing 1910. You can kind of see the extent the, of the map here. Um, again, this is a very large map. And if you zoom in, you can kind of tell that it's just this you know, little point of where Gainesville would be, but is, you know, there's so many of these little communities that you can um, whether, whether they were stops on the railway or, um, you know, as Hank was mentioning, where post offices have been established, um, there's many names that we don't really see around anymore gains, um, that are listed on these maps. One that I wanted to show as a, an example was um, Gold's Goldsboro, Florida, which was annexed by the city of Sanford. Um, it was established in 1891, but it lost its charter in 1911. Um, and when you look at these maps, you can see how it was there along with a number of other communities. It's actually really kind of hard to see, and I apologize for that. But if you look under Lake Monroe, um, there's Sanford, and right next under it is Goldsboro. Um, and right in that location is now they have a, a historical 
um, society, a museum there for Goldsboro to kind of help highlight their, their history. Um, in 1957, however, even though there are still a lot of communities being listed on this map, Goldsboro is not there anymore, um, and it's not being listed. And as we mentioned before, I think the presentation started, there is a little bit of fluidity there. You're not going to go in 1912, for instance, and see, um, it's not like Goldsboro suddenly falls off the map. It's just an evolution over time that uh, how things change and maps and um, are a wonderful way of observing this. Okay, so hopefully you can see things a little better now. I apologize. I didn't realize I had the wrong screen shared. Okay, so the um, yeah, we talked about the sectional maps of Florida. Let me continue on and tell you about the next resource that I wanted to um, consider. And that is our USGS historical topographic series, which um, as part of the regional depository libraries, the University of Florida has, um, we receive topographic maps from the US government on a regular basis. And so we have a, a wonderful collection. We're a regional library, so we maintain that. Um, to kind of uh, to make sure that there is a, a good resource of those maps available across the United States. And USGS have, has actually done a lot of work to digitize those um, and put them into a historical topographic map explorer. And I don't think we're going to have time to necessarily go into it today to show you how to use the tool. Um, but I do encourage you to go in and look at it. Um, I, the link is here and you'll, I can, we can certainly share that as well. Um, the amazing thing, the wonderful thing about that tool is that you can search by place and then um, you can overlay different um, maps that you find in that. And it's very uh, simple laid out as a timeline. So you can see the oldest map, for that place and the most recent map, and then you can kind of compare and contrast the difference. Um, this is the Arredondo sheet from 1890 showing Gainesville. I often like to bring this out for classes to show that we can establish that Lake Alice was named Lake Alice as of 1890 because we have this map. So that's something um, that while it's at least a point in time that we can say, this is what is going on. This map also shows that Payne's Prairie is called um, Alachua Lake. Um, I did not take that portion of the map, but it's another interesting element on this particular um, document. Um, but I did want to, uh, to talk about our lost communities. Um, one example is Pierce, Florida, which was a mining town established in 1906 and gone by the mid 1950s. Um, and here you can see that on the 1949 topo of um, that showed Pierce, you know, it's showing many buildings, it's showing um, quite a bit of infrastructure and development. And then by 1972, those buildings are gone. Um, and even the um, but the infrastructure is still there. And those are the kind of remnants that you might see if you were going to go back in that area. Um, last time I was here talking to y'all, uh, we talked about Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps, which um, is a, another amazing resource that we were very lucky to have um, access to. And again, it's not surprising that it's, this is a a way for people to be able to research lost communities. The Sanborn maps generally are from um, going to be prevalent from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, and they were done to um, document um, buildings so that a fire insurance, the Sanborn fire insurance company could accurately uh, identify how much they should be charging that, <laughs> that building or fire insurance. So they had to do very detailed records as far as what was it made of um, and, and what was it being used for. And that has become a really important piece of the historical record. Bridget mentioned that my favorite city was Marti City and that specifically because I stole her <laughs> slides about Marti City and the Sanborn maps because um, it was a really good example of how you can get some of that extra information, a little more insight into 
that location based on how it was represented on the fire insurance maps. So here you get incredible information, including population information, um, how, you know, how are they serviced with water and fire and, and where is it located? It says 13 miles west of, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can read that, Court How, Court Who, Bridget might know a little better, but um, it is very near Ocala as, um, Carol, it's like a third, of, I think it's one and a third miles west of the courthouse. Courthouse, that's probably, that's what that means, sorry. <laughs> um, and the, uh, and if you look at the sheets for Marti City, you can find the cigar, fa cigar factory as um, Bridget also pointed out. And the Zambor maps are scanned and available in UFDC. Um, for everything that hasn't isn't in copyright currently. And finally, I wanted to tell you a little bit about historical aerial photographs, which um, are going to be for more recent communities that you might be researching. If you're looking from the um, late um, 1930s um, up through present day, uh, obviously we still are doing a lot of photography and satellite imagery of, of regions. Um, this becomes a very important primary resource that shows what is on the ground at that time. And it's used often for environmental, um, to kind of, to research how the environment has changed, um, but it also can help you locate, or it can also help you research some of these lost communities. Um, this particular one because is uh, of campus from 1937, and you can kind of see this is, um, you know, there's uh, the the old stadium, the stadium, and some tracks and fields, and it is uh, a wonderful window into the past. Um, and in this historic. Um, this lost community is the town of Brewster, Florida, which I believe Hank mentions. Um, it was very near Pierce, actually. It was a very similar kind of community where it was established as a mining town in the in 1910, and it was gone sometime in the 1960s. And you can see um, here the 1941 photograph. There's a number of um, houses and communities and by 1968 it's gone. I did actually take a little bit of a, you can see a zooming, zoom in on some of those like houses in 1941. And you can see in 1968, they literally picked the houses up and brought them somewhere else. And you can still see in 1968 that they had a little bit of that, um, the shadowing of where those houses were. And I imagine if you go there now, you can't, there's you know nothing like that would be visible. So these little um, snapshots kind of help tell that story. And these are all important elements to, to doing those that kind of research. So finally, I just wanna again, welcome you all to come to see us in Special Collections and Smathers Library. The map library is on the first floor. Um, you can always do, if you wanna email us, um, that's our email address for re reference. On second floor, we have the wonderful grand reading room and the exhibit is currently out until, is it April? April 8th. April 8th, so you have two more weeks if you're able to come out here. Um, and thank you so much. We are 11.02. I think we did a great job keeping under in the right time frame. Um, this is all of our contact information and um, we would love to hear from you. Yes, and please. Answer there. any questions that you might have. Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? I do see Bud. Go ahead with your question. Thanks, Julie. Um, Moses Levy has always intrigued me because to think that in 1830 he was looking for a safe haven for uh, persecuted Jews was so far ahead of his time. 
and really didn't pick up until the end of the 19th century for, to, with the Zionist movement. Had he been successful and had this community flourished and it had, a, had the same acceptance in America that Jews have had after World War II and the period prior to World War II, that could have made a significant difference in the uh, Jewish population in today's time. My question is, what do we have in the library that talks about uh, this section, if anything, of this period, if anything? Um, well, we do have some materials on Moses. For example, the, the book, which I happen to have, I think in my hand, <laughs> the Moses Levy of Florida, um, we actually have a copy of this, and if you pick it up, CS, again, C.S. Monaco is actually in Micanopy. He wrote this book, and he's sort of the expert on Moses, and he was referring to our collections. I can't remember in particular what he was looking at, but if you check out his, his citations, he'll tell you exactly. I should have looked at the references before I started. Let me see. I can tell you, actually, just offhand. Good thing I brought the book with me. He, um, let's see. Actually, he went to the he went to the courthouse. He went to Spain. He went to Havana. He went to the British Library. He's going all over the place. I'm trying to get to UF. Where is UF? PK Young. He's looking at the David Uli papers, of course. He's looking at the newspaper collection. He's looking at the George Fairbanks papers, the map collection, Carol, the Glunt papers, which I should pull up. Um, he's looking at the Florida, the miscellaneous manuscripts collection, and the Reuben Charles papers to research his book on Moses Levy. Uh, uh, who is the he you're referring to? Um, C.S. Monaco, the, the author of this particular book on Moses. Spell the last name, please. Monaco, M-O-N-A-C-O. Ah, just like the city. OK, thanks. Uh, I'm going to type it in the chat for you. Well, I was going to say someone. Said Monaco books available on Kindle. Yeah. And that's, yep. Let me, let me, I'll borrow your keyboard so you have the same. Carol, Carol I, had, I had a question for you. Uh, those aerial maps, you know, going back like 1937, who was taking those photos? Who was taking those aerial photos? Were they just individuals or USGS? Who, who was doing it? Well, it was actually there were a couple of different agencies and they did change names over time. So um, I believe a lot of the times it was the USDA um, who was doing surveys for agricultural reasons, in which uh, case mm -hmm. for that reason, they did not always take the coast because there wasn't agriculture on the coast. And now yeah. we go back and we were like, no, why did they not? We want to see what it looked <laughs> yeah. like, in, you know, in the 40s. And um, so, but yeah, that's usually is USDA um, uh, soil service, uh, soil conservation service. I'm trying to think there's a couple of other like agencies kind of under USDA that are sometimes um, doing it. Department of Transportation more recently has taken on more of those aerials. Mm -hmm. um, we also get aerial photography from things like um, the Kennedy Space Center has, and uh, the, um, trying to think, water management districts. Um, mm -hmm. have us some. So we actually get them, we get aerial photography from a lot of different agencies. Usually it's not private individuals though. It's some kind of kind of large scale um, operation to get those yeah, yeah. to get those images. So it was, um, yeah. It's been we have one of the largest um, collections for aerial photography of Florida, and um, have received three grants to get them digitized and put online. So we have a pretty significant historical aerial photography collection of Florida. Um, if anyone hasn't looked at UFDC, our digital collections in a while, they did go through a transition in um, the end of the year last year. We are still kind of working through that transition. So if you get into our digital collections and you need extra help, please reach out because we do understand that the new, um, the new platform is we're still kind of create, developing it and creating new features and we want to be able to help you navigate them. 
give, give us a feel for, um, you, you're mentioning uh, if you'd like to come in to um, access the collection for research, how, what kind of volume of, of people come through wanting to reference materials um, in the maps or, or in um, uh, the, the uh, Florida History Department? Uh, are you usually just dealing with three or four people at a time or uh, what's the volume of people that they're accessing the collection to do research? Um, actually, um, Carol, can I, I can't speak for maps, but right now in special collections, we're particularly busy because it's spring break in lots of parts of the country. So people are um, coming to us and while uh -huh. Come to our reading room, there may only be three or four people sitting there, and two of them may be students doing research, but that's actually kind of, um, it's, 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 it's not really a good indication of the amount of reference work we're doing, because a lot of our reference, for example, is coming in for, um, from, from email calls. So that, the number of people is deceptive. We actually are mm -hmm. bringing more patrons than you actually physically see in our space, and I think that's the same with the map library, wouldn't you say, Carol? Yes, um, so one of my other hats is to be in charge of public services for the entire department. And we have a wonderful reference team and we have done a lot to work on providing as much assistance as we can virtually, especially during the pandemic. It's been an important kind of development to kind of really focus on what can we do um, just from the computers. And we actually can do quite a bit because we have really good digital collections. Um, but we do also have regularly, you know, researchers that come in. I would say usually it's not multiple people at a time. You know, we have, we always have a staff person or a student who's out there who's ready to assist people to um, find materials. Um, but, you know, usually the heavier, uh, usage comes when we have like a class that comes in and needs to use mm -hmm. a lot of materials at once and things like that. But, you know, as far as we, um, yeah, in-person researchers, you know, we're getting a couple, we get a couple a day. And then we also, like Bridget said, make, make sure that we provide a lot of really good uh, reference through virtual means. Sure, sure. Well, I'm sure you welcome as many as as, uh, as you as you can as you can get because you've got a great resource there and you like to share it. I mean, that's the whole idea, right? Absolutely. Yes, we love visitors. Come and see us. <laughs> any uh, any other any other questions, folks? Well, thank you very much, all three of you, for for um, um, your presentation. It was fun. Um, I think just looking at the maps is a joy, for example. Um, so we'll see you next week, everyone, um, when we'll be talking uh, about um, the Phoenix School um, and uh, instruction um, that was developed uh, around that school, the Indian School, to, uh, to project um, uh, their culture and um, even Holly will tell us all about it next week. Okay, thank you very much. See you next week. Sounds wonderful. Bye. 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 Bye.